Hello and welcome to another edition of the Tour Degree Cycling Show in association with SportsAid and the Rainer Foundation. I'm delighted today for a very special pre-Giro episode. We've got uh, Team Bike Exchange DS, Matt White, somebody who knows the Giro very well, both as a rider uh, and obviously as a, a direct sportive as well. And probably, you know, he's going to be in charge of one of the main favourites, if not the main favourite, uh, as Tour Degree's favourite, Simon Yates. Um, first of all, Matt, thanks so much for doing this. How how are you feeling ahead of the Giro? Just a couple of days out. Yeah, good. Uh, we've uh, we've spent the last couple of days uh, already on the road uh, doing some pretty crucial uh, recons of uh, of the gravel stage. Uh, I've seen it in March. We wanted to take the whole team there uh, and have a good feel of uh, what the gravel's like. Test some equipment yesterday, and then we arrived late last night uh, into Turin. And we've got a couple of quieter days before we kick off on uh, on Saturday afternoon with the with the prologue. Yeah, you mentioned the gravel stages there. There seems to be this obsession with um, Grand Tours finding kind of new surfaces for you to go over. What do you make of the whole introduction of gravel sections to to certain Grand Tours? And, and certainly, this, this stage is, you know, probably about as much gravel as we've seen in a, in a Grand Tour, isn't it? Definitely. Uh, so I. I like to see the best bike rider win these races. And I don't like, and I know how much effort's gone in from behind the scenes right through, and obviously the riders' preparation and the team's preparation and the amount of money that we actually spend on getting ready for these Grand Tours. And I think um, no one wants to see someone lose a Grand Tour because of bad luck. And and wait, when you see this stage in a couple of weeks' time, it is, it's like nothing I've ever seen before uh, in a, in in a grand tour, that's for sure. And now people, people are saying, oh, yeah, the Strada Bianchi, the start, it's, and it's look, it's not. The similarities are that it's in the same region. It's none of the none of the sectors are the same as we use in March. And I think the, yeah. the difference is when you go to Strada Bianchi in in March, you go there because you know there's gravel and you know that's the type style of race it is. You're put so you're putting a, a field together that's expecting that that obstacle. And I think yeah. uh, the dangers certainly multiply when you're putting a field of varied athletes who are preparing for a three-week tour. And now there's 35 kilometres of dirt in the last 65K, and some of the sections are 13K long with climbs of up to 14 15% gradient and very technical. So I personally am not a big fan uh, because I think, I think it'll look great on television. It'll be a big spectacle, uh, but no one likes to see favourites uh, lose a Grand Tour because of bad luck. And and you know, if you puncture at the wrong time or are involved in a, a crash at the wrong time on that stage without your team car behind you, uh, you, know, you could lose the Giro on a stage that you, know, you, you shouldn't need to. Yeah. Does that change the way you race up until that point in terms of, you know, is there almost a kind of you want a bit of daylight, you want, you know, you don't want kind of slim gaps if it does mean, you know, a bit of bad luck can can see a, a GC favourite tumble. Do you change the way you race with that in mind in perhaps the same way as you might change the way you race dependent on where TTs are slotted into, into proceedings? No, I think what we'll probably do is change the way we race after that. <laughs> after after we see the wash up of that stage, uh, then I think a lot of teams will then ha maybe have to reset their goals for that uh, for that second half of the race, or or be a bit more aggressive because they're trying to look up to make time, or if their riders off general classification, they then they then they change their target for stages. But I think beforehand, there is already some key stages that that we that everyone will be approaching. Uh, the same stage four, stage six, stage nine. There, there's already multiple hilltop finishes and key stages before yeah. we even arrive there. So I, I think uh, I don't think we'll be changing too much the way we approach if, there, if that gravel stage was there or not. But I think after the fact, uh, that will definitely change a lot of team's tactics. We mentioned there in the intro about Simon Yates. You know, they just feel you know, even now still kind of unfinished business for Simon at the at the Giro. He's coming into this in great form. You must be pleased with his preparation so far this season. And and what's he looking like from a from a kind of mental point of view um the, this last few days or so? Yeah, so the the goal from us uh, when we said it last year was we wanted to go uh, after the Giro. We've been we've been here a couple of times. We've had some really good success in 2018. 2019 was okay. But we've we've adjusted some ways that Simon has prepared for for the Giro, and then last year was a disaster. 
just because you know we did the race had uh, barely started, and yeah. uh, and for starters, Simon contracted COVID. Then we found out a couple of days later that we had four or five staff members who also contracted the virus, and we had to go home uh, mid race. So la- last year was a disaster, but there was you know, some things. As we've seen over the last 12 months, there's something we're trying to run a professional sport in the middle of a pandemic, yeah. and there is, there is casualties, and we, we were part of that last year. We're doing everything we can to uh, to avoid that uh, this year, uh, as we were last year, but uh, but I think where Simon is, is is in a really good place. I think the, the preparation phases we had coming in here were about building slowly. Uh, we started his season later, and uh, in, we didn't start the racing until March, so... Uh, after he fully recovered from COVID and we, we got all the tests to, to make sure of that, he started building slowly in December and January with, with a big team camp in Jan. February, we lost our race, our race program in, in February because we were doing all the Spanish program, which all, yeah. got, uh, all got deferred to the month of May, So which wasn't a big problem. We just went back to uh, just training and then we started his program with uh, – with um, Tirreno Adriatico and then Catalonia, where he showed showed some great signs of consistency, knowing that we were we're slowly building up towards the month of May, and then obviously two weeks ago in the Tour of the Alps, we took our core group uh, from for the Giro to that race, and it was a really good exercise in going through how we control the race, how we win stages with Simon, and we have some new guys and some guys who haven't been involved in this core group before, and bringing those guys together. In a, in a high pressure environment, when you're trying to win, I think it will ha, has only benefited the organisation and, and the guy's mental approach coming into the race. So I think Simon's in a great place mentally. I think he's got nothing to prove when you, he's won a Tour of Spain. He's very motivated to win the Giro, yeah. and uh, this was part of his his yearly uh, his plan where he wanted to be in form. And obviously, another one is the Olympic Games later in the summer. But um, he's in a great place going into the Giro, and I think these last 48 hours, it's more about us, you know, just. Uh, Recovering, we've got the work's done, and uh, the racing starts on Saturday afternoon. And we're really looking forward to uh, getting it underway. Do you think as well? I mean, you mentioned there, you, you know, he doesn't be, he doesn't have anything to prove. Do you think he's kind of, you know, with the well to win and and kind of the years of experience that he's had since, um, you know, we know what happened um, in in the Giro. Do you think that kind of are you constantly amazed by his kind of mental fortitude? I mean, the way he recovered from that. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of the mental attitude you need for top level sports. I guess we saw it with Primoz Roglic uh, last year as well. Is that is that ever come as a surprise? Because he seems a really quiet character, but there's obviously a real steel to him, isn't there? Oh, 100%. All, all champions have different qualities, and Simon is certainly a champion. And if you go back to 2018, some people. Where, when really positive things or really or really devastating things happen to people, people approach them in different ways. And, and Simon mm-hmm. went away from, you know, I, I think it was still a, you know, it's still a successful Giro when you win when you're in three stages, yeah. give away one, give away one, have the have the the pink jersey for two weeks, uh, and yeah, yeah, it was disappointing to lose the Giro so close to the end there. But you know, he went away, recovered, came back, and won the Tour of Spain three months later. So it just shows that uh, you know you've got to be able to move on quickly in this sport because at the end of the day, you lose more than you win. Uh, and when you look at, a, at at how many race days you do uh, per year and how many races, yeah, you know, winners are winners. But you've also got to be able to deal with setbacks and deal with them quickly. And, and real champions are able to do that uh, and move on and uh, and refocus on their next target. Who do you see as his main rivals? I mean, we, we're obviously, you know, there's a lot of talk around Ebenepoel, but he's not raced since uh, his crash at uh, Lombardia and Egan Barr now appears to be all of the kind of issues he was suffering. Are they Simon's big two rivals, do you think? Or is there, you know, a Vlasov or even a Mikel Lander who you are also got an eye on as, as perhaps being somebody who could, you know, cause him problems on various days? Yeah, I think those men, names you mentioned are definitely guys we've got our eyes on, including Lander, uh, including Almeida, uh, in, including Hugh Carthy. Uh, I think the the ride that he did in the, the Volta last year, he's really come of age and is still progressing uh, really well at his age. But I think with Bern, Bernal, for me, is the favourite. I think uh, anything that you read that Ineos are putting out about him question, having a questionable uh, back issues, I think the number one, the number one team in the world biggest budget team in the world are not coming to the Giro d'Italia with a leader who is injured or has any type of injury. They've got enough guys sitting on the sideline uh, who are not riding the Giro, but they could have made that replacement easy enough. So 
we know he's ready to go. He's been in Columbia uh, since the middle of March and has been back in Europe for a week to 10 days now. And he'll be ready. He, I see him as the number one favourite. And then those names that you mentioned, I think Land has shown great consistency over the years. He's podium the Giro before. He's finished fourth in the Tour de France two times. Uh, the two young riders from Quickstep, Almeida and Evanpool. Uh, uh, Evanpool, a very, very unknown quantity uh, at 21 years of age, having nine months off and never done a Grand Tour, but still going into the race as one of the favourites. Yeah. Uh, and then Almeida, I think he, he showed last year as a Neo Pro, uh, the way he handled leading this race for nearly two weeks and only, only having one, not even an, an off day. He lost on one day, uh, he lost two or three minutes. But he was still fourth or fifth on the stage. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he will only have improved since last October. And uh, I think they're, they are our key guys. They're the key guys we've got to beat. The two quick step guys, Lander and Bernal uh, and Simon and Hugh Carthy. I think they're, they're the names we've seen a lot of. Lasov is a good one. Uh, another young rider who's developing. And then uh, I think Nibali obviously hasn't had the ideal preparation coming into here uh, with breaking his uh, bone in his hand here. But he, he's going to be a threat. Maybe not to win the race, but to uh, to upset the apple cart somewhere in the third week, as he usually does. And I think even a name that not too many people are talking about um, is Bookman from Bora. He's yeah. had a he's had a pretty he's had a pretty quiet uh, year this year, but there's nothing wrong with that if you if you nail your preparation time. And I think he's had a limited race program, and uh, you saw he finishing fourth in the Tour de France a couple of years ago. He has the, he has the talent and the qualities to uh, to excel here. Yeah. What has the last year kind of taught you as, a, as an organisation? I mean, you, you obviously mentioned the, the last year, which which came to a very abrupt end early doors due to the pandemic. Have you kind of changed the way you, you kind of prep for races or have you learned anything from, from the last 12 months which you think will stand you in good stead going forward as an organisation, as a, a you know team of athletes? Yeah, I think the number one thing is, yeah, we, we do rely a lot on organisations uh, to help us as well once we're on the ground. You know, we, you know, at the end of the day, the teams are the ones fitting the bill for the a lot of the testing uh, going in, you know, into the into the race. But when we when we are in these environment in hotels, we don't we don't choose our hotels. You know, we, the hotels are, are allocated to us, and obviously eating areas and dining uh, and and our uh, separation from the general public is crucial. Uh, I think well, we need to look at last year. Yeah, people were getting on flights last year and going to races without COVID, without COVID, PCR tests. So, I think the, it was actually a, the, probably the most riskiest part of getting to any race last year was the travel get coming in. Yeah, yeah because you, you could be sitting next to someone who had COVID and you had no idea. Uh, whereas at least now the regulations have tightened up a, bit, a lot with travel, uh, and also if there's situations in the race that you know we're not happy with a certain uh, dining area or so forth, we would just be eating in our rooms. We just yeah. won't be taking any 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 risks. And but you know, we, we've been the organisations are doing are doing what they can. But uh, you know, sometimes it's, the, the whole bubble idea it's not bulletproof. We're we're talking about a mobile circus that are changing hotels twenty days out of twenty four days. We've uh, got an organisation of thirty five people travelling around Italy, and uh, we have to leave the bubble to bubble to go to supermarkets yeah. to fill up cars. We're changing hotels, and a lot of these people who are working at these hotels are not being tested neither. And uh, so we've just got to take every every precaution that we can and control what we can control. Um, and just finally, um, looking ahead to the the rest of the year, I mean, obviously it's touch wood we are getting back to some kind of normality. And um, obviously with Flanders being kind of later in the year, uh, not Flanders, sorry, Roubaix being later in the year after World Championships, does it put more pressure on on you as a team to kind of, you know, almost you are extending your season. We know the cycling season's a long season these days, but what are you what are you kind of how are you looking shape wise for the the rest of the year going forward? I think uh, for for our team specifically, this was the first year. Uh, there, there was racing in Australia in January. Uh, there was a, a, a version of the Tour de Nanda, which was only for people who were in Australia. And we had six guys go back for that race, and we won the nationals, and we won uh, we won Tour de Nanda with uh, with Luke Durbridge. But usually, we we sent half our team back to us uh, for the winter yeah. or the summer. And this year, only six guys went back out of our organisation. So. I think if anything, we've probably got more in reserve for this back end of the year. That, and also with the fact we lost three stage races in February. So actually, I think as an organisation, we we struggled a little bit 
in March just to um, get to our, our best form because we had 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 a lot less racing than usual yeah. in the January February months. But I think uh, you know, we've all always planned to finishing off our season sometime in October, and I think the addition uh, of these races. You know, Roubaix, for example, it, it won't phase us at all. And I think, if anything, you'll see uh, you'll see our team getting stronger over the next month or two. Whereas I think a lot of the teams who, especially who have a very very big classics focus, uh, it's going to catch up with them sooner rather than later. I think. Definitely. I, well, we wish you all the best over the next three weeks. Certainly, you know, being a, being a fellow Lancastrian of, of Simon, we've got an eye on both him and you, Carthy, as you mentioned as well. But uh, we wish you and Simon and the rest of the team all the best. And, uh, and yeah, perhaps catch up towards the end of the season and, and see where we're at in terms of, uh, in terms of races won and, and hopefully that, that long-awaited pink jersey. No, thank you. No, well, I said we're, we're in a good place. We, we know there's a lot of competition out there. It's never easy winning these Grand Tours, but... Uh, the, the preparation phases and the amount of effort we've lo- we've gone into looking at the courses, checking out the courses, uh, has gone really well in the lead up, and that's always a good start. It's always a good place to start a Grand Tour with healthy riders and uh, a lot of knowledge in the bank of what's coming up. Definitely, fantastic. See you soon, Matt. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm.